So these are the AUA, ASCO, ASTRO, and SUO combined society guidelines. We know that muscle invasive disease is present in about 25% of patients at presentation. Certainly, non-invasive patients can progress up to 15, 20% to muscle invasion as well. These patients have a potentially lethal tumor and are at significant risk for death of their disease. And despite all of the advances and some of the advances we'll hear of today, at least when we look back on historical treatments, we really haven't moved the needle very much in terms of outcomes or survival. Um, the guidelines overview are an attempt to try and improve that because certainly if you looked at the way patients are managed, um, by and large, they don't usually adhere to guidelines. I won't, in the interest of time, go through the AUA's methodology, but it is similar to what you've seen in other guidelines. High level evidence is A, uh, evidence not so good, but still pretty strong is B, and C's are more like observation studies and, and are not as beneficial. And then the strength of the evidence is combined into this chart where they come up with either strong recommendations, moderate recommendations, or conditional recommendations. So the case, a 73-year-old gentleman with um, hematuria, he's found to have newly diagnosed muscle invasive bladder cancer. He does have some comorbidities, um, has had some diabetes, cardiac disease. Uh, he is a smoker. He has fairly normal exam. He does have some renal insufficiency. In fact, his um, uh, GFR is about 51. So next steps, he undergoes a TURBT in the exam under anesthesia. Um, he gets a staging workup, which is a standard. He does not have any evidence for metastatic disease. His pathology is listed here. It's predominantly muscle invasive, a small component of nested variant. So when we look at the guidelines here, when just like the non-invasive guidelines, if you do have the ovarian histology, it's recommended that an experienced pathologist review that to get a confirmation of that. Sometimes the tumors, particularly if it was a small cell tumor, would definitely go in a different direction. Um, patients should be evaluated, and if they're fit and healthy enough, they should have the options discussed for treatment with curative intent. And it is recommended that a multidisciplinary approach, so while every patient may not be able to meet with a medical oncologist, I think it's important that they be offered options for chemotherapy, neoadjuvantly, discussion should be had, and if possible, it is best if they meet them face to face. Um, the patients are counseled regarding the impact of these treatments on their quality of life, and so I think that's a given. The importance of neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the discussion is highlighted here, and this will be expounded on more in the afternoon, but uh, the strong level and evidence to recommend survival benefit with the use of platinum-based chemotherapy. The panel, however, um, thought that in patients that, that were candidates for neoadjuvant therapy, there weren't any truly validated predictive markers of who would be more likely to respond and who wouldn't and the best regimen other than containing platinum um, is not really well defined. And then you have to consider their performance status as well as other things such as their renal function and hearing loss in, in the decision making. So this patient did see an experienced GU medical oncologist. It was felt that because of his uh, poor kidney function and overall situation that he would not undergo uh, chemotherapy with platinum at, up front, um, and the question became, what about other chemo regimens? Again, the, the guidelines uh, didn't feel like the evidence was very strong for um, chemotherapy other than platinum-based chemotherapy in a neoadjuvant setting, and that they should move on to cystectomy when they're platinum ineligible there. Um, the patients um, who have not received platinum-based chemotherapy who have more adverse pathology at the time of their surgery should be considered for adjuvant therapy later. Um, there, is, there are options, and we'll talk about those a lot in the afternoon, when platinum is not possible. But if he were a candidate for platinum, had not received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it would certainly be a consideration after surgery. Um, not only should he have his bladder removed, radical cystectomy, but also a pelvic node dissection is strongly encouraged, and so 
that is part of the recommendations. Urinary diversion, um, in some patients, you know, there are options for, uh, many options for urinary diversion. In others, older patients, patients that are frail, maybe poor kidney function or other considerations, they may be only a candidate for a ileal conduit, but continent cutaneous diversions, orthotopic urinary diversion, as well as um, the uh, conduit diversions should all be discussed with their inherent risk, benefit, et cetera. Um, the patient uh, should be optimized prior to surgery, and we have a talk coming up on this, the importance of uh, trying to optimize their health going into such a big surgery. The enhanced um, recovery pathways will be reviewed a little bit later, um, but those are all part of trying to improve on the outcome as well as the use of DVT prophylaxis, which is now recommended for at least 30 days after the surgery uh, due to the high rate of thromboembolic events. Other things that the guidelines felt could be incorporated included the use of these mu antagonist, opioid receptor antagonists, if the patients weren't on um, oral pain medication prior to surgery, and the enhanced recovery afforded to them by improvement in bowel function is, is noted. Um, patients should undergo preoperative counseling about their ostomy and appliance, what they're getting into, as well as uh, that during their hospital stay and thereafter. Uh, pelvic lymph adenectomy should be uh, performed. This is an area of, of um, kind of controversy in terms of the extent of the surgery, and you're going to hear about this a little bit later from Dr. Lerner. He is um, a PI on uh, an important study trying to answer the question in U.S.-based uh, uh, group. Um, the uh, limits of the node dissection are not clearly specified, but it is generally felt that should include external, internal, and obturator nodes. There have been studies like this that were published last year that didn't really show a survival benefit in a large group, maybe 400 patients uh, with invasive disease when they looked at the extended nodes versus a more traditional or more limited node dissection, slightly higher complications with the more extended, but the, the jury's not out on this. and. We will talk about it a little bit later. Um, the, the guidelines came down pretty firm on some of these things like bladder preservation. Uh, for patients that do desire to retain their bladders, those patients should go through a multidisciplinary approach. So it's not just a TUR only if they can handle it. They get systemic chemotherapy, the addition of radiation therapy. And this is an area where radiation can be a benefit, um, not in the adjuvant setting as we asked in the ARS question. Um, patients who are medically fit should consent to radical cystectomy, though, and they really discouraged the use of partial cystectomy for all but a small percentage of patients with invasive bladder cancer due to the multifocality, high rate of recurrence, or worse, uh, disease outside the confines of the bladder. Um, patients should not be offered uh, radiation monotherapy with invasive bladder cancer. Uh, the rates of failure are quite high and um, local as well as distant. For patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer who have elected multimodality therapy, it was felt that the TUR was an important component of that and that the TUR should be as complete as possible with best outcomes seen in those patients who can be rendered PT0 with the TUR and then go on to receive radiosensitizing chemotherapy, platinum-based or 5-FU, um, in addition to radiation. And then once they have undergone those type of bladder preservations, any close uh, monitoring with regular CT, cystoscopy, and urinary checks to ensure that they're complete responders. In those patients who are fit for cystectomy but opted for bladder preservation, they can later undergo uh, radical cystectomy. I know Dr. Lerner presented some of the differences in delay um, and certainly with invasive disease, delay can have um, extremely negative consequences on their outcome, but they may have, be considered for cystectomy where they didn't want it up front if they're candidates. And then if their recurrences are non-invasive, those patients can be treated uh, like non-invasive bladder cancer patients in the discussions that we had earlier with intravesical chemotherapy or BCG. Um, 
they really the data for follow-up and surveillance of these patients is not high level, but everyone knows that we should do it. Um, it's recommended that you're monitoring both for cancer recurrence as well as the urinary diversion. So periodic imaging, cross-sectional imaging with CT or MRI every six months, maybe for the first two years, uh, two to three years where most of the recurrences would be found and then annually thereafter. But the importance of monitoring for upper tract tumors is highlighted as well as looking for disease outside the confines of the, of the pelvis. Um, we know that sur you know, support groups are important, certainly for bladder cancer patients who undergo a lot of uh, life-changing and life-altering um, uh, treatments. The, this is very important. Some of the ones, Beacon being a major supporter, but others are listed there, and that we're supposed to continue to encourage them. Many of these patients smoke, have poor eating habits nutritionally, um, they're not doing well, and so we have an opportunity to try and enhance their lifestyle with those type of measures. Future research, better imaging, better ways to detect tumors that have gone beyond the confines of the bladder is needed. They recognize that. We're going to talk today about some important novel breakthroughs with immune therapy, adding to the chemotherapeutic regimens that we have and uh, better vigilant uh, surveillance. Just like the guidelines for non-invasive, they have algorithms uh, that are listed for treatment of invasive disease. Again, most leaning towards radical cystectomy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy up front with the best outcomes and then alternative pathways uh, depending on the situation. This is the panel. It's a multidisciplinary group led by um, uh, Dr. Sam Chang um, at uh, Vanderbilt 